IPv6 replaces ARP with the NDP protocol. The purpose remains the same, however, the mechanisms are much different. In this video, we'll walk through all those details. This video mirrors some content that you'll find in the official CERT guide, Volume 1, Chapter 28, which is about IPv6 on hosts. In this video, we'll organize it first with just the basic idea of neighbor discovery, which replaces IP version 4 ARP, and then the use of multicasts in IPv6 with these NS and NA messages, which is different from IP version 4 ARP. We'll close then with a look at the neighbor tables that you'll see on hosts and on routers. As usual, if you stick around to the end of the video, I'll talk to you about the book section and this video and how to best use the book with this video. And for everybody, I'll tee up some kind of review exercise and tell you how to get into that. Also, thanks for your continued support. There are many ways you can do that here on YouTube, but one way is the super thanks button that I've enabled here on the site. The way that works is you click it, you can give me a few dollars directly to support the channel, and you get a chance to leave a comment that YouTube will format and recognize in special ways. And then monthly, I'm going to add some recognition to the end of a video where I call out all the people that have used Super Thanks. So if you use that, great, but if you use the other mechanisms, that's great too. All right, let's jump in and talk about the content. The Neighbor Discovery Protocol, as a protocol, has several features. You can read the RFC for it if you want to. You don't really have to. First off, it has Neighbor Discovery as in learning the MAC address of neighbors on the same link. So it replaces ARP from IP version 4. There is no ARP for IP version 6. <clears throat> it also defines how to discover routers on the link dynamically. It defines how to discover the prefixes used on the link as well. That is, the host doesn't calculate what subnet exists. It learns it from the router. It also uses NDP messages and defines a process for, quote, duplicate address detection, or DAD, kind of a fun acronym, but it's a way to figure out before you use an address if someone else is already using it. And then there's this idea of redirect. If you've got multiple routers on the link and you send a packet to one router, that might not be the best exit point from that subnet. So redirect says, hey, use this other router instead. So that's a quick overview of some of the features. Now, this video focuses on this neighbor discovery feature. The next video will talk about router discovery, prefix discovery, and duplicate address detection. So what are we talking about here with this neighbor discovery? Well, imagine A has to send an IP version 6 packet to C. So A, of course, knows its own addresses. It knows its own unicast IPv6 address, its own unicast MAC address. So it can build this packet, can encapsulate it in an Ethernet frame, and plug in the source address fields in those headers. Now let's also say that A is at the point where it already knows C's IP version 6 unicast address, whatever it is. C is ready to, quote, send a packet to C's address. The missing piece of information is C's MAC address. And with IP version 4, that was learned dynamically. It's learned dynamically with IP version 6 as well. So that's the question. If I want to plug in a destination MAC address field of C's unicast MAC address, its MAC address, what do I plug in there? Well, the answer is that you can use neighbor discovery protocol, or the host can, to learn what MAC address to use. That information ends up being stored in A's neighbor table. With IP version 4, it was stored in the ARP table. There's no more ARP, no more ARP table. It's called the neighbor table. And it would list C's IP version 6 address and C's MAC address. If A did not know that information already, it would use the neighbor discovery protocol messages, neighbor solicitation, which is the request, and neighbor advertisement, which contains that MAC address advertisement, uh, to learn that information. So let's compare and contrast version 4 and version 6 for the basic rules of how to build these table entries. With IP version 4, it's an ARP table, and let's just say the table is empty. So A wants to send a packet to host C, so A sends an ARP request looking for C's MAC address, and that ARP request is going to have a field called the target IP, and it lists C's IP address so that when C gets it, C can think, hey, that's me, I should reply and supply my MAC address. And here's C sending an ARP reply. So it's ARP request and reply 
in that older protocol. And once that information arrives back at host A, it adds C's MAC address to its ARP table. So as long as A and C are communicating, it doesn't need to keep repeating this ARP process. It's cached there in the ARP table. Now, a similar flow happens with IP version 6. It's just not ARP. It's neighbor discovery protocol. So the table is empty in this case again. So this NDP neighbor solicitation, we're soliciting the information, if you will. So A wants to know C's MAC address. It puts as target C's IP version 6 address, sends the message. The switch delivers the message over to host C. Host C sends a neighbor advertisement in a message back, which contains the MAC address so that host A can build its neighbor table and have the correct MAC address to use. The people that made up IPv6 looked at the use of broadcast by ARP and said, that's bad, let's do better. <clears throat> so let's review what ARP does. ARP does not include an IP version 4 header in here. It's got an Ethernet header and then the ARP header. It's a separate protocol from IP. So when A needs to learn C's MAC address, as in the previous examples, it builds this Ethernet frame in order to deliver this frame to host C, and it has to use this destination MAC address of the broadcast MAC address. By doing so, when it sends this Ethernet frame, the switch is going to flood the frame. That means B, C, and D will all get a copy, and that was considered bad because B and D, here's their logic. Receive the ARP message, process the ARP message, look and see some other device's IP address in there, and then throw it away. So there was a lot of overhead ARPs going on that bothered hosts, whereas C is the only one that needed to get a copy of this ARP request. All right, so the people that made up IPv6 said, that's bad. And while the process worked, said, we can do better. And the way they would do better is by using multicast. So just to sum up with text, IP version 4 was using that Ethernet broadcast address. So NDP, neighbor solicitation, uses an IPv6 multicast address as well as an Ethernet multicast address. All right, so I'm going to show you an example with hosts A and C again of how NDP does that. So again, for IP version 6, A wants to build its neighbor table to learn C's MAC address. So there's the IP address, the unicast IP address of C there. So that's listed in the as the target in this NDP neighbor solicitation message. Now I'm emphasizing the word solicitation here, all right? So here's the deal. Both A, who needs the information, and C, who has the information, they know the rules about how this works, and they can, get this, they can take C's known IP version 6 address and derive the multicast IP version 6 address to use and the multicast Ethernet address to use to make this process work. It's all behind the scenes. You could live life and work with IPv6 and not know how this works, but for the exam, it's useful to know how it works. So here's how it goes. Either host, A and C, A, when it's building this message, can take this known address and do a calculation and come up with something called C's solicited node multicast address. That's the address to put in as the destination IP version 6 address. Solicited neighbor solicitation message, NS message, solicited node multicast address. That's the connecting key there. Then this message has to be encapsulated in an Ethernet frame. The destination Ethernet MAC address is going to be a multicast MAC address. And by convention, it starts with four threes, 3333. Three, three, three. And this number is calculated from C's solicited node multicast address. So when A is building this, it knows C's IPv6 address, and it can calculate those other values to put in this message. Now, it seems like a lot of work compared to ARP. It is, but here's the beauty of it. The message comes in to the switch, and the switch is smart enough to know to not forward a copy out on these ports and to only forward it over to host C because of some multicast logic in the switch. All right, so it's greatly improved in terms of not bothering hosts when they don't need to be bothered. Now let me show you how hosts calculate their solicited node multicast address. This top box represents one unicast address that a host knows. Remember, it's got a prefix and an interface ID. 
and we'll focus on the last six hex digits of that unicast address. Then the host will take this 26 digit prefix and combine that with the last six hex digits of the unicast address to form this new number, and that's its solicited node multicast address that corresponds to this unicast address. Now this value would be unabbreviated, so of course you can abbreviate that quite a bit. So the abbreviated values you'll see in show command output will start foxfox02 colon colon one colon foxfox with six hex digits that match the last six hex digits of your unicast address. Additionally, when frames are sent to it, the destination Ethernet MAC address is formed by taking 3333 and filling the last eight hex digits from the last eight, not six, but eight hex digits of the solicited node multicast address. Isn't that fun? So it's not hard, it's just a lot of minutia to figure this out. For instance, in this case, the solicited node multicast address ends foxfox123456. So there's our foxfox123456 at the end of that MAC address. We'll close this video looking at a few neighbor tables, but first for a little context. Look at A, B, and router R1 over here. They're all neighbors in terms of what you see in a neighbor table or an ARP table with IP version 4. That is, you'd expect to see entries for each other in the neighbor table. But from A's perspective, none of these other MAC addresses and IPv6 addresses need to be in A's neighbor table. That is, this R1 right-hand interface, the R2 left-hand interface, the R2 right-hand interface, S1's IPv6 address and MAC address. None of those are needed. So the neighbor table is needed for communications with other devices on the same link, on the same subnet, all right? So with that context in mind, let's take a look at a few neighbor tables. So here's A in that router R1 that we just saw. So most of your communications is going to be off subnet. So A is going to need a neighbor table entry for router R1, for instance. R1 is going to need neighbor table entries for the host in the subnet. So in this case, we'll look at R1's neighbor table. So here we have A's MAC address and its global unicast address, or GUA. R1's neighbor table will, of course, list that GUA. There it is here, and here's the identical value down here. You can take my word for it if you don't have to read every last little digit. So there they are, and it lists the link layer address of 0211, etc., down to a 1, which matches the MAC address. So there's the entry in R1's neighbor table for this GUA and MAC address. So if R1 wants to send a packet to that global unicast address, it knows the MAC address to use. Note that you will also see link local addresses in the neighbor table. Link local addresses are indeed unicast addresses. They're just addresses whose packets stay local on the link. So I don't show A's link local address, but let's just say, for instance, that this FoxEasy80 value here in R1's neighbor table is host A's link local address, it is. It will also list A's MAC address as the MAC address to use to reach it as well. So expect to see paired entries, one for the GUA and one for the link local address for each host when a router is communicating with it. Now on the flip side, how about the host's neighbor table? So over here on the right, we see router R1's config with its global unicast address and a MAC address configuration, so it's obvious what MAC address it's using. So host A's neighbor table listing information about router R1. Here is router R1's global unicast address, along with the quote physical address, that is the MAC address used to reach router R1, just in a little bit different format. And we don't show R1's link local address up here, but that's it here. If you wanted to go through the link local address calculation process with the UI64, you have an example here you could use. The link local address on router R1, it's calculated from this MAC address is this FoxEasy80 value down here. Notice the same MAC address we've got on router R1 shows up here as well. So again, host A will see the router's global unicast address and link local address, or at least it can. Thanks for sticking around till the end. All right, if you've got the books, look at Volume 1, Chapter 28, Section 1. That's the one about IP version 6 from the host perspective. 
That first section is about the neighbor discovery protocol. And in my opinion, it's a very important topic. So even if you understand everything in this video and the associated other video about this section, read the content in the book anyway, you wanna master this, All right? So it's two content videos. Now, those two content videos, this one about neighbor discovery and the next one about router and prefix discovery, watch both of those. For everyone then, there is an interview review that's got a lot of detail in it that goes through everything in both of those. So I'm gonna set up that interview review video at the end of the router and prefix discovery video. So stay tuned for that. Thank you so much for sticking around to the end. Hope you enjoyed the video. As always, click things that help me build the channel, like subscribe if you haven't already, click the bell to be notified, click like to signal to YouTube that you liked and that you wanna help me get the word out. Hey, thanks for hanging out. Hope you enjoyed it. Talk to you soon.